This show is sponsored by IdealWorkspace.com, which promotes a healthier way of working through their adjustable standing desk. Check out their latest smart adjustable standing desk at Altizen.com. A-L-T-I-Z-E-N.com. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business, technology and media in Asia. In this episode, I speak to Rob Wickham, Regional Vice President, Innovation and Digital Transformation from Salesforce, on the footprint of the company and their recent report on innovation in Asia-Pacific. Hi Rob. Hi how, Bernard. How are you doing? I'm very well. Happy to be here with you today. Thank you for hosting me during lunch hour in Salesforce Singapore office. Our oh, pleasure. We're, we're delighted that you can spend some time here with us today. Yes, and I'm talking to Rob Wickham, Regional Vice President, Innovation and Digital Transformation for Salesforce. Before we get into the main subject of the day, which is an interesting report about innovation, all eyes on Asia research, I would like to get to know you better. How do you start your career? Sure, so quick story. I grew up in the Caribbean, in the West Indies, and started my career once I graduated from MIT in Boston as a management consultant working for BCG in New York at the time. Moved on to spend some time in Australia as an airline specialist for BCG and then joined a startup airline in London, as you you would believe. We ended up selling that to a competitor. And then after business school, I joined a technology startup in Boston, spent about eight years there doing a variety of leadership roles, including marketing, product management, and then towards the end, took over sales for North America. Uh, We ended up selling that to Oracle, did a little bit of time at Oracle, and now I'm at Salesforce. So in your career journey, given that you have actually been through so many different industries, what are the interesting career lessons you have learned? It's an interesting question. I think one of the biggest lessons to me, and I attribute this to my undergraduate experience at MIT, is just having a growth mindset. And having this disposition of just wanting to continually learn and knowing that you can learn and tackle any problem. And I think that gives you confidence to change industries. That gives you confidence to change roles. But at the same time, it also makes life exciting because I think there's so many interesting things out there to know that if you just lean in and put yourself in a position to absorb good things will happen. So one of the things I do is I interview prospective students I live in Melbourne who want to go to MIT and they often ask me, what should I study if I go to university? And I tell them it doesn't really matter what you study as long as you're studying something that you're passionate on. It's the fundamental skills that you're going to pick up along the way. And it's really one of the best skills you can teach yourself is how to learn and how to have that habit of learning throughout life. I'm in Salesforce. I know what Salesforce does. I use Salesforce as a CRM tool for my business. Can you briefly t- give an introduction to the company Salesforce to my audience? I know it's in Silicon Valley and what it does. Sure, happy to. Happy to. So we've been on a journey now for 18 years. The company started in San Francisco in 1999 when our founder and CEO, Mark Benioff, had a simple idea. He wanted to make enterprise software as easy to use as buying a book on Amazon. And think about it, back in 1999, that was a radical idea, right? Today, cloud computing is a pervasive mainstream concept, but back then it was really disruptive. And that led to three disruptions in the marketplace. One was a new business model, software as a service, pay as you go. Two was it ushered in cloud computing, enterprise cloud computing. We really pioneered that space. And the third, was Mark wanted to create a new philanthropic model to have an impact in the world around us. So we took 1% of equity, 1% of time, 1% of product, and put that into a foundation. And 18 years from, from then, it has really grown to have significant impact in terms of nonprofits and volunteer hours and so forth. Today, we are the fourth largest software company on the planet. And we continue to help companies, large and small, figure out how to transform the way they sell, service, and market to their customers. And you also pioneered the term App Store too, right? As I hear from Mark's interviews with various uh, podcasts in the US. So what is your current role and coverage within Salesforce? Yeah, so I lead innovation across Asia Pacific. 
And that's for us is a combination of things. It's really helping companies figure out how to build their businesses or accelerate their businesses on Salesforce. So whether they're startups or small companies, also helping larger companies figure out how to transform their business to pivot to their customers more more successfully. You know, right now we live in these uncertain times, which I think is a global phenomenon. Some people refer to it as the fourth industrial revolution. To us, it's really the collision of two macro forces. One is where everything is getting connected, more connected and more intelligent. But then at the same time, we're seeing globalization really become a factor. And I think that's leading to a lot of uncertainty for businesses, regardless of if they're large, dominant businesses or small incumbents. And I spend a lot of time helping, whether it be governments or CEOs or startup founders, figure out how to transform in this new normal. What's the footprint of Salesforce in Asia Pacific? Look, Asia is a growth engine for us. We typically don't break out specific numbers by geographies, but suffice it to say that we're looking to Asia to help drive our continued growth. And and we've got a fair number of customers across the spectrum, whether it be small, medium, or large businesses who are doing interesting things. So I one of, one of my favorite stories here is because I fly a lot into Singapore is Changi Airport. So Changi Airport, award-winning airport for service, continues to try to think how to improve the level of service that it delivers to the millions of customers that go through the airport. And they've, they've been working with Salesforce for years now to transform their customer service efforts. So if you've been to Changi recently, you know, if you go through customs, you press a little smiley face on the tablet there. That's a Salesforce capability that allows them to continually measure and monitor and manage the level of service that they're delivering throughout the, throughout the airport. That's very interesting. We come to the main subject of the day, which is Innovation or Eyes on Asia. It's a report that you did together with YouGov Research. So I think I will start off first by asking, what are the main objectives for Salesforce in building a report on innovation about Asia? Yeah, so I think it, it brings together Buna, two things that we think a lot about. One is customer success and innovation. Customer success, so we're constantly trying to figure out how we can do things to help our customers be more successful. And then innovation is core to our DNA. And we started, as I talked about earlier, through this, this disruptive journey in 99, and we're constantly thinking about how we can continue to deliver value to customers through innovation. So this report is a nice way of bringing those two things together. We think customers throughout the region will get value in reading that report and getting some of the insight in it. But I think it also highlights some of the areas where specific countries within Asia, because You know, to us, you have to look at Asia as separate countries. And within the report, you know, here in Singapore, given that we're sitting in the Singapore office, we surveyed about 100 IT professionals and IT decision makers, getting their view on priorities and the meaning of innovation and so forth. I'll tell you some of the things that jumped out at me. The first thing that jumped out at me was that we ask customers, when you think of innovation, what word comes to mind? And we collected all of that and created a word cloud. And you saw the usual words like different, products, services, new, creative. And when you stared at that word cloud loud, long enough, one word, which to us is vitally important, was missing. And that is the customer. And for us, innovation is all about how do you do things differently to drive better outcomes for the customer. And while people may say that's an obvious point, the fact that it was visibly missing from the word cloud sends a message. The other thing that I think was interesting was we asked the respondents, which countries do you think within Asia are the most innovative? Japan came back as number one, Korea came back as number two, and China came back as number three. The fascinating thing about that is even within Singapore, if you look at the Global Innovation Index, Singapore is the number one ranked innovative country within all of the countries that they um, that they look at. They're, they're number six on the list, but number one amongst Asia countries. So the fact that the respondents within Singapore viewed other countries as more innovative than them 
says that you're in the aircraft while it's turning and you don't know that it's that it's accelerating and turning around you. One interesting thing, I have the opportunity to actually read the report. So one of the things that it was mentioned in the report is that innovation according to the Asia's movers and shakers is the process of creating new and novel solutions to fulfill unmet customer needs. Does that align with how Salesforce or yourself, your, in your own opinion, what innovation is? Yeah, I think that's accurate because it talks about unmet customer needs, which to us is all about the customer. We get asked often how the Salesforce think about innovation, mainly because we have been recognized consistently by Forbes magazine as one of the most innovative companies on the planet. And for us, innovation has two dimensions to it. It's the things that we continue to do to deliver innovation to our customers. But more importantly, it's the things that our customers are doing to transform their businesses to deliver better outcomes for their customers. And that's where I think the true innovation happens. But the strength and the value of that innovation is measured by the impact it has on the customer. Because if you come up with a really cool technology, but customers don't value it or it doesn't deliver a better outcome for a specific customer, then you've got to ask yourself, how innovative is it really? Right? So our central lens, one of our core values is around customer success. So that's why we always try to push that narrative and encourage our customers to think about better outcomes for their customers. Here's what is interesting to me. The report reviews what Asia's innovation landscape looked like from the perspective of the key information technology decision makers within the region. Where do you see are their current priorities and challenges in thinking about innovation? Yeah, so I think one of the things that jumped out to me was some of the challenges that the respondents pointed to in terms of their ability to embrace technology. Because we think companies today that are successful and this is not an Asia thing, we think it's a global phenomenon, are the ones that can do three things. One is they can have strong customer empathy, so they have created structures and mechanisms within their organizations to better understand their customers. Two is they can move at speed, and there's this notion of bimodal IT that Gartner talks about, and we think the ones that are successful in tinkering with the engines while the aircraft is in mid-flight are the ones that are really out front. But the third, which is also really compelling, is those that can embrace new technologies like cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and use it as a service to drive their business forward. And that bit, the feedback we got from the report was the things that are holding companies back in Asia are cost, access to skills, and access to the ability to keep up with the rate of change. Right? So that, on the one hand, makes a lot of sense, but it also informs the way we think about bringing new capabilities to market, like artificial intelligence. And if I go back to the earlier comment around the history of Salesforce, making enterprise software as easy to use as buying a book on Amazon, our strategy for artificial intelligence is making AI as easy to consume in the enterprise as it is to consume in the consumer world. So you look at how easy it is today. I got two young kids, 10 and 13, and they upload photos all the time to Facebook and it automatically recognizes the, the faces. They don't have to tinker with it. They don't have to tune it. They don't have to wrangle with the data. And you think about that experience and the experience that you have in an enterprise where you have to spin up servers, you have to go out and get data scientists, you have to go out and write your own algorithms. So that's the problem that we're tackling to make AI as magical as electricity. One interesting point in the report is that Asia is perceived. I think I have to highlight the word perceived as dominating the global scene for innovation. I think it's about 77% today, but it's trailed by America in the second spot. I will probably just use a, another industry, an automotive industry. The biggest cars are built in Detroit. The big companies like Ford, General Motors. The most innovative car company is Tesla. It's also in America, but it's mm -hmm. in LA and some parts of it is in Silicon Valley. Where do you see Asia's innovation primarily coming from? Is it mainly from coming from China, Japan, Korea, or other parts of it? Or each particular region has its own flavor of innovation? I think it's hard to look at Asia as a category. Again, I think you've got to look at the individual countries. And when I look at Singapore, I am encouraged 
by the work that's being done here, particularly led by the government and its innovation agenda and the billions of dollars that they're pumping into the local economy to get the settings right. And I think you have to think about it as ecosystems. Where are the ecosystems most developed? And those ecosystems are going to create clusters for different domain expertise, right? It's like if you are growing wine, you would grow, again, I live in Australia, and Shiraz grows in the south, and Pinot grows in, in New Zealand. And if you try to grow one in the other, you get bad outcomes. And I think when you look across the world, you're going to see innovation hubs crop up for center of excellence. But I think the job of the government in each of those hubs is to fertilize the soil, to get the settings right from a tax standpoint, from uh, an ability to get talent into the country easily, from an ability to attract venture investment, et cetera, et cetera. And you look at the things that's being done here in Singapore, I think it's leading the world. In fact, in Australia, we look to Singapore as a model for some of the things that, that we're trying to do there with the government innovation agenda. So I think that is interesting. The other question is which domains we think are going to lead the world. That's still an open question and I think up for grabs right now. And that's part of the fourth industrial revolution narrative that's, that's being hotly debated. But what about in the East Asia side? I mean, like China, you have WeChat, which is a totally different messaging system by itself. If you look at, say, Japan, robotics is very prevalent and Korea, I guess, other than cosmetics, they also have most of the screens. They, they, when you talk about uh, Samsung and LG, they have the best screens that's been used by almost every mm. phones in the world. That comes to the other point, right? Culture seems to be very imperative in driving innovation within organizations. And most leading business leaders who I've interviewed here often agree on one thing. There's no one unified Asian culture, but there is Chinese culture, Japanese culture, Indian culture, or their individual cultural nuance. Does cultural nuances and also their level of economic development factor in how they think about innovation? I say that, for example, if we look at, say, Indonesia, it would be an emerging market. When you look at Singapore, Japan, Korea, it looks a very developed market. Mm. Where do you see that factors in? I think culture has a lot to play in general. And even within one country, there are cultural differences between organizations that's going to impact this. As I mentioned before, I spent a lot of time in my role talking to organizations on this topic. And it's fascinating to me how quickly we get to that point, which is around cultural mindset. And whilst there are differences by regions, I still think there are some fundamentals that persist, which is an appetite for risk. Regardless of the cultural environment, if you don't have the right appetite to take risk, to put yourself out there, to be prepared to fail, the entrepreneurial spirit is a juxtaposition with a strong belief that you can run through walls but at the same time that if you fail, it's okay, right? And that in and of itself is a contradiction in terms, but it's fundamental in order to make progress. And I think in certain organizations, people feel because you don't, just to be an entrepreneur or just to be innovative, you don't have to be in a startup. You can be in a big company trying to do really interesting things within the organization. And I think you're seeing a lot of companies now trying to figure out how to foster that spirit of innovation within their organization to look more like a collection of startups. And one of the challenges there is how do you empower the employees to go out and try things, to experiment, and still feel that it's okay if they don't come up with something substantial, they, they have not limited their career within the organization. And a large part of that comes from the leadership. It comes from the top. It comes from the types of things that are rewarded. What behaviors do we reward? And what behaviors do we celebrate? And how do we handle circumstances where someone has done a project for six months and then they have to wind it down? Right? Because the best thing you can do is capture the learnings, wind on the project, instead of throw in more money at it to, so that it limps along. So those are the things that I think are important when you think about driving a culture of innovation, and those are fundamental on a global scale. One interesting question I have is, is Asia ready to embrace innovation? I mean, here's a very interesting conversation I have recently with some of the SaaS companies, software as a service pioneered by Salesforce. 
And they often complain to me that there are inherent difficulties for most Asian companies to move from a traditional enterprise sales cycle to now SaaS models. I mean, of course, Salesforce being known is easy to adopt, but when it comes to the rest of the other SaaS models, it becomes difficult. What are your thoughts on how people could break these barriers down to embrace innovation as it comes? I mean, we talk about AI, they are all embedded. We mm. still even talk about Internet of Things, they are also embedded mm. within our ecosystem. How do you get these companies to start embracing this innovation? Well, I think it's a challenging question on the one hand, and it's a multi-part question. And I think part of it is a generational, the answer is a generational shift. So we talk about this concept of digital natives and digital immigrants. So my kids, 10 and 13, are digital natives. That's just the way they view the world. They will never go out and build a generator to put electricity in their house and just consume it out of the wall. That's the same way of building software and running it on premise in terms of running it as a service. So I think we're seeing the needle move in terms of organizations beginning to realize the disproportionate advantages they can get by consuming capabilities as a service, mm. right? And if you look, I mean, one of the things I did today was to attend Cloud Asia. And the fact that that is a central topic being discussed right now means that it's front and center in the minds of major businesses here today. We view the same way as when you think about artificial intelligence, which is it's a capability that can and should be as ubiquitous and democratized as electricity, where you don't need an army of people in order to tap into those advantages you don't need a ton of resources. It should be a native capabilities in the solutions that you consume. And that's the path we're going down as we build out our Einstein capability. So that's the way we view the world. And we think that it's a force that you just have to face into. I recall from the very beginning of this conversation, the missing word in the word cloud is customer. And customer retention is, is the key strategic priority for Asia's companies. And in fact, according to your report, 70% of respondents views this as a top priority in the next 12 to 24 months. How would you advise them in thinking about customer retention? And where do you think AI will sit in this part of the customer retention? Sure. So customer retention, and, and that also jumped out to us, the fact that that was a priority. Our starting point would be to think less about retention and think more about advocacy. You want to create brand advocates. You want to create people that are passionate about your products and services. And retention will take care of itself. If that's your mission, if that's your North Star, if that's your guiding principle, retention will take care of itself. And more importantly, now you've got an army of effective de facto salespeople walking the streets for you. So how can you create compelling experiences for your customers where they become passionate about your product and they tell your friends because we live in a world today where customers are hyper connected always on highly opinionated and they make their buying decisions long before they interact with the brand their mindset are driven by brands that did not exist five to ten years ago we all know who they are uber airbnb facebook etc so the challenge for companies today is how do you become closer how do you understand your customers better so that you can drive that advocacy. The answer is in the data. That's where the magic is. So what we encourage our customers to think about is tackling the problem in three distinct pieces. One is you gotta collect all the data. It's a simple yet challenging thing to do. And collecting the data has two pieces to it. One is collect all, connect all the data within your organization that you have of your customer. One of the challenges that we see a lot of organizations have today is that the data are in silos. You've got a sales lens of your customer interaction. You've got a marketing lens of your customer interaction. You've got a service lens of your customer interactions. And if a customer calls into any one of those departments, the others don't know about the, they don't have visibility. So connect all of those together. So you've got a 360 degree view of the customer within your company. But then separate from that, find ways to tap into the other sources of data that your customer out there are generating, whether it be through their social channels, through their location, footprint, etc. There are a variety of things that you can do there. Once you've done that, you've created a reservoir that you can now build context. 
The second bit is to start reasoning over that reservoir. And that's where the ins that's where getting the insight is. And through capabilities like Salesforce Einstein, you can do that now as simple as you can with electricity. And the third most important step is now you should be able to take action. Because if you come up with an insight, but you can't insert yourself into the conversation in that moment of truth, then the opportunity has been lost. Mm. And that could be a location-specific notification. It could be an in-app notification. It could be creating a case. It could be whatever else it is. But you have to, as part of your strategy, be able to take action based on that insight. My penultimate question. What are you going to be watching for the key trends of innovation within the next 12 months? Well, I think what we are seeing right now is a world where everything is becoming more connected and more intelligent. If you look at the world through that lens, then you're going to start looking for use cases. How are people using? More connected means you've got more data. More intelligent means you've got more machine-driven systems that allow you to harness that data. And the innovation that we're interested in is how customers are using that to deliver more inspired outcomes for their customers, right? More personalized service that drive advocacy, whether it's be transforming the way we shop, transforming the way we buy, transforming the way we travel, transforming the way we relate, transforming the way we sell, transforming the way we work. That's where I think it becomes really exciting as we face into the next five or so years. Hmm. Rob, thank you for coming on the show to discuss your perspectives and thoughts on innovation. So my final question, help my audience, how do they find you? Ah, that's an easy one. So you can find me a variety of ways. You can follow me on Twitter at RR Wickham. I tweet a lot on this topic. It's something that I'm passionate about. So that's a good way to stay connected. Or you can just drop me an email at rwickham at salesforce.com and happy to have a conversation. You can find me at blongcw at bernardleong.com. Subscribe to us at Analyze Asia, A-N-A-L-Y-S-E Asia. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Acast, and TuneIn, and of course Google Play in the US market. And we have recently launched our newsletter, that which actually gives you daily insights. And of course, tweet to us, give us a five-star rating on iTunes, and give it, recommend us on Overcast, and of course, tweet me comments. So Rob, once again, thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure, Bernard. A lot of fun.